Hi, welcome back to Corporate and Organizational Leadership. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at an overview of North House, North House Chapter 3, which explains the skills approach to understanding leadership. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at two versions of the skills approach. We're going to look at an older, simple, three-skill approach developed by cats in the 1950s, and then we're going to use a, look at a, a more modern skills model that corresponds really well to how we tend to think about leadership development um, that was developed by Mumford in about the year 2000. Now, let's look at an overview of the skills approach, both models included. First of all, this perspective on leadership is, once again, just like the, the trait theories, leader-centered. That means we're looking at the leader. We're not saying that leadership belongs to the group. It's, we're not looking at the followers too much. We're, we're looking at the leader and focusing on what the leader's responsibility is, how the leader become, develops a leadership. Um, and so we're focusing on the leader. Now, unlike the trait approach, it's an there's an emphasis on skills that can be learned and developed. And so that's different. The trait approach kind of assumes that, yeah, we've got these traits. Now, we as Christians said we can develop those and move by the power of the Holy Spirit in certain directions. But this approach to leadership assumes that everybody has the potential to develop their skills to some degree. Now, the what would we... What would we how could we define leadership skills? We could use it as the ability to use one's knowledge and competencies to accomplish a set of goals and objectives. So it's like using what we have, whether that's our knowledge, our experience, our uh, beliefs, our values, our abilities that have been uh, developed. We use those to accomplish a set of goals and objectives um, which include getting other people to uh, work towards the objectives also. Now, let's look at the, the first model called the Three Basic Administrative Skills, uh, developed by Katz in the 1950. And in this uh, uh, approach, you can see there's three columns here, three different sets of skills. There's technical skills, and this is easiest to understand maybe in a manufacturing context. When you're manufacturing something, I used to, for a while, I worked in manufacturing in, in aerospace, you need some technical uh, skills to actually put together uh, these satellites or uh, spaceships or airplanes, whatever we're putting together. Um, that might include soldering skills. It might mean uh, welding skills. There's, there's all kinds of skills that are needed to actually manufacture something. Another set of skills have to do with human skills, and that's how to deal with other humans so that you can coordinate your efforts, so that you can get done what you want to get done, so that you work together rather than against each other. And then there's uh, conceptual skills that include problem solving, dealing with abstract ideas, and figuring out what needs to be done next. Now, in Katz's uh, uh, three basic administrative skills model, each level of management needs to have a different set of skills. So down here at the bottom, the supervisory, these are the people that are actually uh, leading people who are manufacturing. The supervisory management needs to have good technical skills. They need to know what the technicians, the workers uh, need to be doing so they can show them, so they can teach them, so they can model them, so they can fix uh, problems that go on. They need to have good human skills so they can get everybody to work together. But in terms of conceptual skills, the big picture of what's happening, that's not a high priority. Now, middle management, they, need, they still need all the technical skills. And they still need human skills, but they, they need more conceptual skills to be able to coordinate uh, uh, all the activities that are going on uh, that are led by their, uh, um, uh, the supervisory uh, managers below them. Now, the top management, this is where it's kind of interesting and also debatable, um, they need less technical skills. They don't need how to solder. But they need good human skills, and they need uh, good conceptual skills to uh, um, coordinate all of the efforts. 
Now, this, this model works really good in a manufacturing context. In a service-oriented or a software-oriented uh, company, uh, this idea that technical skills are not always uh, necessary for top management might be a bit more debatable. But it's a, it's a good approach in that it shows that, that different skills are needed in different contexts. Now let's move on to a more modern uh, approach. And this is Mumford's skill model. And it was developed in the 1990s, and one of his uh, uh, most cited papers was done in 2000. And the goal of this model is to identify the factors that maximize a leader's performance, especially problem solving. Kind of Mumford was really concerned about well, what can leaders do to solve problems? What, what causes good problem solving? So, so his research has focused a lot on problem solving. That seems to be, from his perspective, the main thing that, that uh, leaders need to do. Now, unlike the trait model, which emphasizes uh, what uh, traits are necessary in, in leaders, um, Mumford's model emphasizes the capability, the capabilities that make effective leadership possible rather than what leaders do. We're not looking at habitual behaviors, traits, but we're looking at their uh, capabilities, their capacities. So we say this is a capability model. And in a capability model, that assumes that you can develop your capabilities, and that means that a lot of people have potential for leadership. Some people already have the capabilities, other people need to develop those capabilities, but they have what's necessary to, uh, to advance their uh, leadership uh, abilities. Now, let's look at the skills model in two steps. First, we're going to do is just a in this slide, we see uh, the first three components of the skills model. We're going to make it a little bit more complicated, but let's get the first three components uh, down right of way. We start off with individual attributes, and this uh, is kind of similar to traits, but it's a little bit more uh, broad. Um, people have their general cognitive ability. That's basically how smart they are, how uh, well they can deal with uh, um, abstract ideas. There's crystallized cognitive ability, and that is how much stuff you know. Generally, if you're high in cognitive ability, you can learn stuff. That's, that's one ability to define what cognitive ability is, is the ability to learn. Some people will learn a lot of stuff. Some people uh, won't learn a lot of stuff. Um, so, and we call crystallized cognitive abilities basically the stuff that, that you learn and that stays in your uh, tool chest. This this general cognitive ability, sometimes that's called fluid cognitive ability, the idea that uh, um, you can take any set of uh, any, uh, uh, any information, any set of data, and you can analyze it and figure out what to do uh, from there. That's why we call it fluid versus crystallized. So crystallized cognitive ability is basically uh, um, uh, uh, the, the background information that you know. Um, we've got motivation which um, describes uh, uh, the desire to, uh, to lead, to get things done. Uh, some people are high, some people are low. Um, it depends. We have different motivations to do different things. Um, and uh, then we've got uh, uh, personality. And like in the trait model, everybody has uh, different traits. So we start off with these. And the individual attributes that we have will influence the competencies that we will develop. We can develop problem-solving skills. Uh, we can develop uh, social judgment skills. We can just we can gain knowledge in uh, all of these areas. And the more competencies that we have, the more likely we will have positive leadership outcomes. And that uh, is... Um, um, especially in this model, is a effective problem solving, and that's the main way that uh, uh, Mumford measures uh, performance. So these are the first three components in the skills model. Nothing uh, ground shaking here, but there's two other, com two other uh, components that we need to uh, um, look at. And so here's all five components. We have, still have the individual attributes, help develop competencies, which lead to positive leadership outcome. But down here below, we've got some things that influence 
all of these uh, components. First of all, we've got career experiences. The idea that the more experience you have, hopefully the more competent that you will be in that field. So our career experiences, they interact with our attributes and they lead to uh, various competencies. So if you've got uh, uh, whatever, with whatever general cognitive ability you have, plus your experience, that will give you some uh, problem solving skills. Uh, uh, same thing with uh, the, the crystallized cognitive ability, your motivation, your personality. The, uh, the different experiences that you have um, e um, enable you to uh, develop social judgment skills, your knowledge, which again increase uh, uh, the likelihood of positive leadership uh, uh, outcomes. And so there's the experiences that you have in your job, and that's, that's typically why organizations ask for um, a year's experience, two years experience, five years experience, it's because the idea is that, that you learn through these ex experiences. But there's also environmental influences that affect, uh, that interact with your uh, attributes and uh, contribute to your competencies, which lead to leadership outcomes. And these environmental influences can be quite broad. They can be things like getting a, a, an education, working on a Master of Arts in Management uh, uh, program. It can have to do with the economy. The uh, uh, economy, the national culture is going to push, make certain uh, uh, competencies even more valuable. Um, it'll, uh, um, the, the skills that you have will be more uh, desired. They'll give, the, the environment will enable you to um, uh, either um, De uh, develop the strengths that you have or push you into new directions where you have to develop new strengths. And so this, uh, this environmental influence is, is also a big factor in influencing our uh, uh, competencies. Now, these skills approaches, they have a number of strengths and also a, a few weaknesses. I really like the skills approach. I think it's an excellent way of looking at um, leadership. Um, and so uh, one of the strengths of this, it describes leadership in terms of skills that makes leadership basically available to everyone to some degree. Everybody's got some potential, and if they develop it, they can use it. Now, it might not necessarily be in the way that we want to, especially with the environmental factors uh, influencing uh, what, we, uh, what we do. Um, it's, it's good because it emphasizes the role of experience and environment, whereas the trait approach didn't do that. It was kind of like, you got what you got, um, that's going to determine uh, 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 how uh, good of a leadership that you'll, you'll be able to exert. And now, as an educator, something that I really like about this is that it provides a structure uh, that's consistent with the intuitive appeal of leadership education programs. We, we have this idea that greater education increases your capabilities. I certainly believe that. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you looked at my background or whatever, you might notice that, that I have a bunch of master's degrees. Um, I, I never planned to go into academia. I basically, it's like, well, whenever I needed to master some subject to increase my capabilities, I got a, I got a master's degree. And, the, and I really believe that um, getting master's degrees like you're doing, like I've done in the past, um, gives you a set of tools that makes you a lot more uh, capable and to have a uh, greater influence in the situations and uh, among the people that you're uh, around. So uh, in educational programs like ours here, we're thinking that you're going to develop your capabilities and that will enable you to uh, make better decisions and be better leaders. Now, there's a few weaknesses and criticisms concerning uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the skills approach also. Um, one is, is that the skills approach is really pretty broad, um, and you can kind of apply it to all areas of life. So it's pretty general and uh, less precise and doesn't really tell you what to do in any specific situation or how to, how to actually solve problems, just that you can increase your ability to, uh, to solve problems. So 
it's pretty broad, not very specific. Now, I think because it's, it is broad, it enables us to, uh, to get the big picture of what we're trying to do in gr developing our leadership uh, skills. But people that want specific things to do in specific circumstances aren't going to be too, uh, too excited about this approach. Um, another criticism is that even though um, it tries to move away from the uh, trait approach, still the attributes that you start off with are pretty similar to traits. And so uh, uh, once again, traits become uh, pretty important.